that we get started. Um, so we are very happy to welcome uh, Jesse Shapiro here today, a brand new member in the Quantitative Life Sciences uh, program and a recent arrival at McGill. Um, and he has a really interesting uh, background before getting here. So he started at McGill with a BSc in biology, um, then Oxford University for a master's, master's degree, um, MIT for a PhD in computational systems and biology, and a postdoctoral fellowship at the Broad, followed by um, a number of years at the University of Montreal, where he had a Canada Research Chair in Microbial Evolutionary Genomics. So it's a very impressive, a very impressive track record, Jesse, and we're really looking forward to your presentation today. Um, please go ahead. I think you should be able to share your screen. All right, great. Well, thanks, Celia. Um, and it really is my pleasure to be here. Um, I hope to meet many or all of you one day in person, but and definitely to chat more um, after the seminar too. And I'm really thrilled. Uh, to be a member of QLS. Um, so I will share my screen um, and get my slides up. All right, can you see my title slide there? Yep. All right, excellent. Um, uh, so that's right, I'm, I'm really thrilled to be a member of QLS. Um, but the PhD program I did at MIT, Computational and Systems Biology, uh, is very much, I, I think has the same philosophy and, and, and kind of scope of as, as, as QLS. So I'm, I'm, I'm really excited um, to be uh, uh, part of the QLS program and to, to interact with um, this cohort and future cohorts of, of PhD students. Uh, so today I'm gonna talk to you about pan-genome evolution on human timescales. Uh, my, my Twitter handle is there, my lab website. Um, I'll put those up at the end as well. So if you wanna contact me or uh, check out more about the lab. All right, so I'm going to start with a little bit of history. So um, the discovery of the pan genome, so this concept that different members of a species can encode different sets of genes. And uh, this dates back more or less to the early 2000s. Um, so around, so in, in 2002, a, this study by Welch et al. compared uh, three E. coli genomes that had been sequenced. Um, and looked at the number of, of shared genes between them. So I'm going to start with a question, and you can just think about it, or, or uh, people can even throw out their answers in the chat. There's not too many people. There's actually a fair number of people logged in. Okay, so you, you can write your answers in the chat, or you can even holler it out. So uh, if we compared three human genomes and asked what, what percentage of genes are shared, right, where you, me, and Celia uh, share a homologue of that gene versus genes that might be unique to one of us. So what percentage would be shared? We do actually have an answer in the chat. All right, so let's see. Let's see if I can. There's the chat. Let's see. Most of it will be the same, says uh, Bianca. Okay, 80%. Not over 90%. 99%. 99.9%. All right, I'll leave it there. So that's, I, you know, I, I'm not gonna actually put an exact, convergent has been achieved. We're sort of, we're, we're, we're hitting an asymptote there. So uh, that's right. I mean, it's something like 99 or even 99.9%. I'm not gonna put an exact, figure on it, but really the vast majority of the 20,000 or so um, human genes are, are common to all humans. And there, there can be some exceptions where uh, there might be uh, occasional deletions or duplications or maybe even a virus integrating and, and, and bringing a new gene. But I just want to contrast this with uh, what these authors saw in E. coli, and they were really surprised. So that this three-way genome comparison, these three strains, um, and this is a quote from this paper, um, amazingly, only 39.2% of their combined sets of protein coding genes 
actually are common to all three strains. Okay, so then uh, this is the core genome, is this 39.2. And then the accessory genes are all of these ones, 585 or even 1600 and some genes that are present in this one strain, but not another. All right, so the pan genome can, can be um, pretty dramatically different than the genome of any one given organism. And, and uh, for, for the students here, um, I suggested this as a, a journal club paper that we can discuss a bit later, uh, which is sort of an introduction, but also kind of an, an opinion piece on why prokaryotes have pan genomes. And they phrase this not as a question, but as like, this is why. Um, and and, and, and we, we can talk about those reasons in a moment. Um, so just to sort of define these kind of Venn diagrams, right? So. I think from that E. coli comparison, it should have been pretty clear from the example, but the idea is that the, the core genome are the set of genes that have a, a homolog present in um, each individual, so each genome that's compared, right, which are these ellipses. Um, the accessory genes are genes that are present in one or just a subset of those genomes, and the whole, the whole thing combined, the pan genome, is the total set of genes encoded by all members of a species. And for bacteria, uh, this can be quite dramatically different uh, from the genome of any, any given member of the species. All right, so um, this is a quote from this uh, McInerney, McNally, and O'Connell paper. Uh, they conclude that pan genomes are the result of adaptive, not neutral evolution. So uh, there's a, basically all these genes in the pan genome are there for a reason. They're helping bacteria adapt to a particular ecological niche. Uh, it's not just random. They're, 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 they're not viruses and selfish elements. Um, they are really have an adaptive role, not neutral. Um, so I assigned this paper because it provides a good introduction, but then this is not an uncontroversial statement. And um, actually in the same year, uh, in uh, early 2017, uh, this paper came out um, from these other authors, a short communication, which essentially provided a neutral interpretation of pan genomes. And they concluded that accessory gene turnover is for large part dictated by neutral evolution. So this is a, a neutral interpretation. Um, and it's a short communication with one figure. So I'll actually just show you the figure rather than trying to, sum, uh, to summarize. And essentially what they did is uh, each point here is a different bacterial species uh, with, with many members. So uh, dozens of, of, of representatives of that species downloaded from NCBI GenBank. And what they did here is they plotted um, the synonymous diversity in the core genome. So this is just point mutations at synonymous sites. So sites that don't change the protein structure. And this is kind of an approximation for a molecular clock, right? So point mutation just ticking along over evolutionary time. And they plot this against a measure of genome fluidity, which is uh, their measure of pan genome diversity. So it, it's essentially gene presence absence, um, genes coming in and out of the genome over evolutionary time. And they see this uh, positive correlation. And their interpretation is that the pan genome basically follows a molecular clock where gene gains and losses ticks along over evolutionary time as these presumably neutral point mutations also tick along. So their parsimonious explanation for this is that most of pan-genome evolution can be explained by a neutral model. And it would actually take um, a more complicated model to invoke all of these, these niches and um, adaptive value for pan-genomes. Okay. So, uh, we, we, we do have a bit of a, a controversy or at least different interpretations of, of these pan genomes that are on the table. And um, most of what we know about pan genomes is based on relatively long evolutionary time scales. So actually in this plot, each of these points is, is a bacterial species, but the genetic diversity in, in that, um, within that species can actually be millions or, or, or hundreds of millions of years old. So this is based on pretty ancient um, divergences. And, and, and this is the case uh, for both um, this Andriani paper where that plot comes from and also other comparisons. Uh, so this paper by 
um, uh, Sila, Wolf, and, and Kunin um, actually underlines a lot of what's in that McInerney paper, which is a perspective paper. Uh, they really rely on, on this paper um, to, for, for their conclusions. And that also is based on genome sequences downloaded from NCBI. So when I say long or unknown evolutionary timescales, it's really just downloading everything that is available in a database. And so we, we don't really have a sense of, of evolutionary time scale. So in this talk, um, I'm gonna focus on shorter evolutionary time scales, which are arguably more interpretable um, about what's going on. And, and we can actually measure um, uh, evolution at the population level, um, at least where we have some sense of time scale. So uh, we're gonna talk about pangenome evolution during an, uh, an acute infection of uh, a, a bacterial pathogen. Uh, so that'll be the first part. And the second part, more broadly, in the human gut microbiome. All right, so I'm going to start with Vibrio cholera. So this is the pathogen of, of interest. Um, a lot of my work centers on Vibrio cholera. So I'll give you a little introduction and highlight some, some aspects of its, its uh, genomics and its ecology. So Vibrio cholera is native to aquatic systems. So you can find it uh, in estuaries, um, uh, coastal areas around the world. It's probably native to the Ganges River Delta. So there's a lot of Vibrio cholera cases around Bangladesh, but uh, you can find uh, Vibrio cholera in the marine environment off the coast of New Hampshire, um, uh, um, probably in the Gulf of, of St. Lawrence, although I haven't looked, uh, but there are um, aquatic strains pretty much everywhere around the world. They live by forming biofilms on, on zooplankton and other crustaceans. As they have a whole bunch of niches um, in this aquatic environment. One particular group of Vibrio cholera that I'll, I'll refer to as the pandemic group, which is basically a clonal expansion uh, which is really just a small subset of the genetic diversity that's present around the world in all of these aquatic systems. So this clonal expansion um, is really what's responsible for the, the disease cholera, where um, the different environmental strains of, of Vibrio cholera can maybe cause um, uh, slight disease, mild diarrhea, um, but really the pandemic group is kind of a professional pathogen that causes severe diarrhea and dehydration and actually is, is probably more specialized to the human gut environment. So uh, to, to make a long story short, we think of cholera as a waterborne disease where someone will, um, will drink uh, contaminated water or food. Um, Vibrio cholera will use the human gut as an amplifier where it will just grow up to trillions and trillions of copies, outcompete uh, pretty much the rest of the gut microbiome in so doing, make this person uh, very sick with diarrhea, um, and, and uh, if untreated, there's about a 50% um, mortality rate where people will die of, of dehydration from this severe watery diarrhea, through which the bacterium will disperse back out into the environment, or as we're learning um, uh, more commonly than, than thought, actually from di direct human-to-human uh, -human, uh, transmission or fecal-oral transmission. All right, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how uh, even during these very acute infections that only last a few days or a week, it, it's possible for uh, Vibrio cholera to evolve um, within patients. And um, you can ask questions about whether it's actually adapting to that human host environment on very short time scales of, of just a few days of infection. One notable feature of this pandemic group is the cholera toxin. So CTX, um, this is the, the key virulence factor um, that is really responsible for pathogenesis, pathogenesis for this watery uh, diarrhea. And to bring it back to this concept of pangenomes, CTX would be considered to be part of the core genome of the pandemic group. So it's really uh, present in all members of the pandemic group. And it's present sporadically um, in other environmental um, isolates of Vibrio cholera. So it's 
necessary but not sufficient for pandemics. So it's part of the, the pan genome of Vibrio cholera, the species as a whole, part of the core of the pandemic group. But uh, because it seems to be necessary but not sufficient, leads to the question, what else is necessary for to explain the success of the pandemic group at uh, infecting humans and causing disease? So the, the first question I'm going to ask in, in this talk is, are there other virulence adaptive polymorphisms, not just in the pan genome, so not just the presence of CTX, but in the core genome, so more subtle uh, polymorphisms that are also uh, required for this full-blown pandemic phenotype. So what we did is a comparative genomic study, uh, which um, identified OMPU as the candidate VAP. Um, VAP. So I'm not going to go into the details of this study, um, but basically we did, we screened phylogenetic trees uh, to find ones that looked um, interesting. So this is the, um, the, the gene tree for OMPU. And you can see that it really um, contrasts with the core genome phylogeny. So if you build a phylogeny based on the entire core genome, so that alignment, you get this star-like phylogenetic tree where essentially all, all these different lineages are kind of equally related to each other with not much structure. And you can see the, I'm always going to show the pandemic group as, as this one branch um, in, in orange. And you can see that the, the phylogeny for OMPU looks quite different where there is more structure, where we have this, uh, the, the pandemic group that's here, but we have these pandemic-like alleles where I'm, I'm again um, just showing the names of these two uh, genomes, GBE658 and 428, which in general, right, so on average in, in the core genome, they're just pretty distant, as distant as everything else uh, from the pandemic group, but just for OMPU, they seem to encode alleles that are more similar. So they branch, they're not identical, but they branch closer to the pandemic group um, compared to these other um, uh, genomes, right? And, and I, sh I should say that uh, the pandemic group is in orange, but then in, in contrast to that, all these blue branches are just environmental um, isolates of Vibrio cholera. So they're not um, associated with pandemic disease. So our hypothesis here is that these pandemic-like alleles that are present in environmental strains might confer virulence traits. So, so there might be these sort of uh, virulence adaptive traits that are circulating in the environment that haven't quite achieved their potential because they don't have all of the necessary requirements for pandemic disease. Uh, so with uh, my collaborator, Salvador Almagro Moreno, we did most colonization experiments to, to, to test this hypothesis. And um, OMPU was really a nice candidate because uh, it was actually already known that a knockout of OMPU will reduce the ability of a pandemic Vibrio cholera strain uh, to colonize a mouse by about a log fold, about um, tenfold, uh, where you have um, wild type pandemic Vibrio cholera versus a knockout. And we're just measuring how, how well they can, um, they can colonize a mouse. So uh, consistent with our expectation, if you replace, if you don't just do the knockout, but you actually replace the pandemic um, OMPU allele with either the GBE428 or 658, so these pandemic-like alleles, consistent with their, their sequence similarity, right? So they're not identical, but they have a similar sequence. They also allow uh, almost pandemic-like colonization of the mouse uh, compared to this allele, which is sort of all the way over the other end of the phylogenetic tree. So quite different in sequence space, behaves pretty much like a knockout. So this suggests that OMPU um, is a genuine virulence adaptive polymorphism where the pandemic-like alleles uh, behave basically like the pandemic um, uh, version of this gene um, and 
allow Vibrio cholera to colonize a, a, a mammalian host. There appears to be a trade-off where if you test another phenotype, so this, uh, this is colonization of a mouse, but we also tested uh, biofilm formation. So this is just a measure of the thickness of, of a biofilm that's formed um, by these different strains. And it really shows the opposite, where the OMPU knockout forms really good biofilm. This um, environmental kind of allele, GBE114, also forms really good biofilm. But either the pandemic or the pandemic-like alleles really form very little biofilm. So it's, it's a tr it seems to be a trade-off where you're either good at virulence, so host colonization, or you're good at biofilm formation. Okay, um, so moving on to uh, variation within individual patients. So that, that first bit was really looking at the, the broad diversity of Vibrio cholera um, uh, across aquatic environments and across all the diversity in, uh, in pandemic strains. Now we're gonna ask um, what's happening within individual patients. So the first question we ask is, do we expect to see any evolution within patients? And um, the answer to this question, it depends on the mutation rate, right? So higher rates of mutation, higher chance of, of, of seeing um, uh, evolution or seeing genetic diversity, and of course the time, so the amount of time for that diversity to be generated. We can kind of turn, make this binary where we know that viruses have higher mutation rates than bacteria, and chronic infections have a longer amount of time in a patient in order to see evolution. So there have been examples, uh, classic examples in viruses like HIV and HCV, um, where there, there are uh, examples of, um, of evolution of pathogens within patients. Um, in bacteria as well, so Burkholderia infections or even Bacteroides, which is the commensal um, in the human gut, uh, they're there for quite a long amount of time. And then in viruses um, that are acute infections, but then have relatively high mutation rates like Ebola and Lassa virus. So Vibrio cholera really is in this kind of nether region of a low mutation rate and an acute infection. So we don't know if we are really um, expecting to see evolution happening within patients. So uh, to undertake this work, this is a project with collaborators um, at MGH in Boston, at the ICDDRB in Bangladesh, where we're getting samples uh, from cholera patients. And it's really the work of a, a PhD student who just graduated from my lab, Ines Lavad, uh, with two postdocs, um, Eve Tekka and um, Jean-Baptiste Leduc. So what Inez did, this was published a couple of years ago, is she looked at uh, five cholera patients from Bangladesh. So these are the labeled with a B, and then three from Haiti um, after the, 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 the Haitian outbreak in 2010. And from each of those patients, she isolated uh, between it, about 10 and 20 individual um, colonies of Vibrio cholera and sequenced each of them in order to compare them and see if they differed by either point mutations or uh, gene gain and loss events in, in the pan genome. And she did a control where she took one of those colonies and then plated it out again, uh, just to control for any mutations that might have happened in the lab or any sequencing artifacts for when we do Illumina sequencing, um, there's a particular error rate, and just to make sure that all of our quality filters for calling mutations uh, were such that we don't see any variation um, in this control. So that's indeed the case. So um, each of these circles represents an individual genome that we sequenced. And if it's gray, it means there's no variation. So if the control is clean, there's no variation. Um, and these colored uh, circles are point mutations that we observe. So you can see that uh, for most of these patients, we really see no point mutations and we see up to three in this one individual. So relatively low level of, uh, of, of point mutation. We can also look at the core genome, so gene presence absence. So this is a heat map showing um, across the different patients, 155 genes that vary in their presence absence. So this is our, our pan genome analysis. So red means the gene is present, um, black means it's absent. So this is our control, uh, which was subcultured from B1, so from patient B1, so you can see it looks, the profile is, is pretty much identical 
uh, to patient B1, and you can see that there's no variation within the control. So again, um, uh, that's a good sign. That means that we're, we're confident in our ability to detect uh, gene presence absence without a lot of false positives. So what are these chunks? So this is just sort of clustered according to these patterns. So um, this, this cluster A is an in element. So it's basically a plasmid that can integrate um, into the genome. And you can see that it's actually part of the core for Bangladesh. So all these patients have all of these genes. Uh, but in Haiti, it can be variable and even to be, it can even be variable within a patient. Um, this is a kappa phage, so also a, a, a phage, a, a virus that is integrated into the bacterial genome. And again, you can see that it's, it's um, present in all members of patient B1 and B5, but it can be more variable with the other patients. And then there's these rare genes. Um, which are of, of particular interest um, uh, because they don't really follow, 